the book of Exodus. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, 1 through 15. Probably a familiar story for, for most of us. Um, let me jump into that here. Uh, chap- Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What then shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, stay, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Let's pray. Father God, as as we look into your word this morning, we pray for your spirit to anoint us, that we may understand what we've read and be drawn closer to you, the author of life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Has anyone this morning ever heard the name John Coulter? Anybody familiar with, with who John Coulter might be? Um, he played music. He played music? Yep. Did he? Um, the John Coulter that I'm thinking of didn't play music that I know of. I'm, I'm talking of a, a different John Coulter, I guess. Uh, John Coulter was a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, exploring the western frontier uh, at the beginning of the country, really, in the 18, 1803 they were commissioned by Thomas Jefferson to explore the new land that was obtained in the Louisiana Purchase. Um, 1803, think about how early that was. That's 25 years after the formation of our country. Uh, that's really early in our nation's history. Um, <coughs> Jefferson wanted to know what, what land, what territory they got in the Louisiana Purchase, so he commissioned um, Lewis and Clark to, to go and investigate, to go and explore. And so they did. Coulter was one of the men that went along with Lewis and Clark. Uh, after they successfully made it to the Pacific coast and had turned to come back, that's an 8,000 mile journey, all on foot and, and canoe. Uh, quite, a, quite an undertaking. On their way back to Washington, D.C. to report to Thomas Jefferson, they, they made it as far back as, as maybe North Dakota, present-day North Dakota, when John Coulter, well, when the group came upon a couple of men who were trapping and, and looking for furs and things, and, and Coulter asked for permission to leave the group 
and to go and show them some of the territory that they just explored, uh, some of the great places that that culture thought they could find the furs that they that they were after. Uh, he was granted permission and uh, actually spent the rest of his life in, in that region of North and South Dakota, currently North and South Dakota. Uh, he never stopped exploring. He was instrumental in a number of Indian treaties. Uh, he was the first to discover uh, what's, what's now known as the Yellowstone National Park. He was the first to see the Teton Mountain Range, which is now the Teton National Forest, I think it is. Uh, he, a, a lot of firsts. In fact, he was the first to be called a mountain man. In, in the United States. He's truly an explorer, uh, truly a, uh, a rugged man who, who loved the outdoors and loved to be there. Uh, now, now this area, especially in South Dakota, was Blackfoot Indian territory. And, and one day while inspecting uh, some traps by canoe looking for some furs, uh, Coulter and a friend were, were suddenly surrounded by Indians. The friend made a run to try to get away and was killed immediately. Coulter was captured, brought back to uh, the tribe, the Indian village there, uh, where he appeared before the Indian tribunal, the council, whatever they had. Uh, he was sentenced for whatever and uh, sentenced to death. But they didn't want to kill him outright. They wanted to have some fun with him. So they took him out on the prairie, stripped him naked, took his shoes and everything, and, and, and made him run. And they gave him a very short head start and then about 200 Indians took off after him. And it was a hunting party, it was a hunting game. And John Coulter was the prey. They had gone several miles, and there was, uh, Coulter was a very fast runner. And after several miles, uh, five miles I believe, uh, he had, had distanced himself enough from the majority of the Indians. There was only one Indian assailant close enough to really be harmed to, to Coulter, and, and so Coulter turned around, and he threw his arms out, and stood like this, in, in front of the Indian, and, and the Indian was so shocked, that as he tried to stop and throw his spear, he tripped, the spear landed in the ground, Coulter picked it up, and killed the Indian, and then took off running again. Um, there's a, uh, John Bradbury wrote a book about this, called Coulter's Run, and, and I'm going I'm to read from this book here. It says, he turned and saw the savage not 20 yards from him. Determined, if possible, to avoid the expected blow, he suddenly stopped, turned around, spread his arms. The Indian, surprised by the suddenness of the action and perhaps by the bloody appearance of Coulter, also attempted to stop. But exhausted with running, he fell while endeavoring to throw his spear, which stuck in the ground and broke in his hand. Coulter instantly snatched up the pointed part with which he pinned him to the earth and then continued his flight. Now he ran three more miles after that, so he'd run five miles. Now a long distance runner we hear could do that, but, but somebody running that while being chased by Indians, that's at, at top speed running for your life, that's quite a run. Uh, he runs a couple more miles and he makes it to the Madison River. Um, and uh, that's... Well, he made, he made it to the Madison River, and he sees a beaver lodge in the river, one of the little pumps sticking out of the, the water uh, that the beavers would live in, and, and the entrances are underwater. And, and so he gets to the water, and he, and he goes down, and he comes up in the beaver lodge, and he stays there the rest of the day. Uh, later that night, he comes out under the cover of darkness and, and walks for 11 days until he gets to a, a trading fort on a little bighorn. So he, he made it. He got away. Um, not too many people get away from situations like that. Uh, but he ran away and he successfully made it. Uh, have, let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever wanted to run away? I hope you've never had 200 Indians chasing you. But have you ever wanted to run away? Have you ever just thought that life is just so hard, that, that things are just so complicated, maybe I should just... Go someplace else and start over. Have you ever thought that way? Uh, if, if so, maybe we could find an ally in John Coulter. Our reading this morning was about Moses. And, and you know what? We could probably find an ally in Moses as well. We're familiar with that story. I, I read quite a lot from, from his encounter with God 
in, in the wilderness outside of um, outside of Midian. But uh, I, I just want to make sure we understand the whole story. We understand his his birth, right? We, we remember that story. How, uh, in fact, going even back further than that, Joseph brought the Israelites to uh, to Egypt to avoid a big plague, uh, and and Joseph finds favor with Pharaoh. Uh, they're able to stock up lots and lots of wheat uh, and grain. And he brings his family down to Egypt to avoid the, that plague that comes. And, uh, and then Joseph dies in Egypt. Uh, the Israelites stay there. And, and it's, they're, they're, they're there for over 400 years altogether. Most of that, see, after Joseph died, the Egyptians quickly forgot the favor that Joseph had with Pharaoh. And they made them slaves, servants to the Egypt, Egyptians. And, uh, and over hundreds of years, as they continued to grow as a people, the Egyptians began to be a little nervous of them, a little scared of them. There's, there are getting to be so many of them that they thought if they ever joined forces and tried to escape, we'd be powerless to stop them. So they, they tried to do some, what we call today, some population control. They, they determined that every Israelite boy, every Hebrew boy, would be killed at birth. Ordered the midwives to carry that out. That any time they delivered a boy, they were to kill it at birth. Well, somehow, Moses and his mother were able to keep Moses, uh, Moses' sister and his mother were able to keep him alive uh, at birth and, and they kept him hidden as long as was possible. When, when they couldn't keep him hidden anymore, they, they devised a rather brilliant plan. They went down to the river near where Pharaoh's daughter would generally go out to bathe. And when she went out one day, they made this bassinet out of reeds that they found along the shore. They made it waterproof with some pitch from some nearby trees and they waited for her to enter the water. And when Pharaoh's daughter entered the water to bathe, they, they let this bassinet float down the river. Now Moses' sister was on shore following along, hidden in the weeds to make sure the baby was discovered. And, and sure enough, he was. And she pops out of the weeds, revealing herself, saying um, that uh, offering up her mother as a, a nursemaid, they didn't have formula back then, right? You need somebody that can nurse the baby if you're going to keep him. And, and so sure enough, Pharaoh's daughter decides to keep baby Moses, bring him up as her own son, and hires Moses' own mother, unbeknownst to Pharaoh's daughter, uh, to nurse the baby and, and take care of her for the first several years. So Moses grows up in the Pharaoh's house uh, with all the, the benefits that you might expect Pharaoh's son to have. He, uh, or, or grandson at least, he was raised like a prince. But one day, and, and he's all grown up, he's probably almost 40 at this time, and he's, and he's walking and he sees an Egyptian, probably a slave master, beating one of the Hebrew people, one of the Israelites, but one of Moses' own people. Uh, and, and he gets so filled with rage that when nobody's looking, he murders this man. And he hides the body so that no one would find it. Thinking he got away with it, he, he goes on the next day, he's walking through, and he hears some of the Israelites talking. And, and the Israelites are almost taunting him, saying, what, are you going to kill us like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And he realizes that his secret is out. And so what does he do? He runs away. Uh, Moses ran to Midian. Now, does anybody know where Midian is? Midian is, is all the way down. I was going to get the pointer for this so I could show you. But Midian is, is down here. This is Arabia. This is Egypt over here. Um, so it's, it's the other side of Arabia. Uh, Midian is mentioned several times. Uh, for some reason, it's not on any of the biblical maps that I have. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. that It's mentioned several times in Scripture, but it wasn't included in any maps that I have in my Bible. I had to dig around a little bit to find it there. Uh, Midian is mentioned several times, as I said in the Bible, but it's never really mentioned in a very positive light. Um, 
in Genesis, when Joseph is sold into slavery to begin with, which set up this whole story, uh, it was from traders from Midian that he was sold to. They took him and sold him into slavery in Egypt. Judges 7 talks about delivering Midian into the hands of the Israelites. Numbers 31 talks about taking revenge on the Midianites. Psalm 87, uh, David begs God to do to his enemies what he did to the Midianites. So apparently Midian was not a great place. And, and God ultimately destroyed it. But Moses fled there because it was a safe, a safe distance from, from Egypt. So he could, he could start his life over and, and get a new beginning. It, it couldn't have been too bad a time, uh, too bad a place at Moses' time. Because Moses found the priest Jethro there. And, and kind of made a friendship with him, went to work with him. Uh, in fact, eventually even marrying his daughter. So life for Moses got pretty good. He had become uh, comfortable in Midian. He, he had a good home. He had a good wife, the daughter of, of a priest who he worked for. Things were comfortable. Things were going smoothly. Uh, he, had a, he had seemingly successfully run from his past and was able to start over again. Now, now while he certainly wasn't treated like uh, a, a prince like he was in Egypt, uh, at least he wasn't wanted for murder either. So things were looking up for him. Until we get to this passage that we read this morning, this is kind of a, a, a turning point, one of those turning points in an already exciting life, uh, a turning life, a turning point for Moses. You see, Moses is at work, he's out tending his flocks, and as we read, he sees his bush on fire. Um, that might be a rare sight, but, but I can't believe maybe it's a miracle. You know, you come across a bush on fire in the wilderness. It doesn't happen very often, but it's not, you wouldn't think it's a, a really amazing thing to see that. Um, bushes don't happen to catch on fire very often on their own, but, but it's not necessarily a big miracle if you happen to see one. So I imagine Moses is going up to this bush to put out the fire, because miracle or not, bushes burning by themselves in the middle of the wilderness is, is probably not a good thing. So he approaches the bush, and, and here's where I think it becomes a really amazing thing. In, in verse 2, he tells us that an angel of the Lord, first part of verse 2, an angel of the Lord appears to him in flames of fire from within the bush. So in this burning bush, he sees an angel of the Lord. As he approaches the bush, an angel of the Lord appears to him through the flames. Now, that's pretty peculiar. That's a really amazing thing. We don't see an angel of the Lord very often, do we? Then he notices, as we read on, he says, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So, so there's a fire there, but it's not really consuming the bush. The branches aren't charred. In fact, you can still see the yellow, uh, the, uh, the green on the bush. Uh, it's not, not burning up. It's not being consumed. It's not being destroyed. And so, and so Moses says, and I don't know about you, but this is where I get really puzzled. Moses says, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. You know, you know when I read this, I, I think to myself, really, Moses? That's where you're going with this? You see an angel of the Lord, and then you see a bush that's not burning up, and you think, hmm, I'll go see the bush. Did he completely miss the angel of the Lord? You know, we think, we think about distractions. We think about things that keep us from those things that are primarily important in our lives. Uh, I think that's what happened to Moses. Moses got distracted by fire and totally missed the angel of the Lord. I, I kind of laugh at that. But, you know, we do the same thing, don't we? Too often we miss God in what he's doing around us. We don't see him in the provisions he gives us every day. We don't see him in, in the wildlife that comes to our feeders or, or wanders through our yards or our woods. We don't see the beauty of our surrounding, the mountains, the waters, the rivers. We don't see him in the everyday examples of grace and mercy he shows us. We don't see him in our healing. 
We're lucky if we see him in our salvation. Too often thinking, we're not really bad people. We're not that bad. We're bad enough to need God's grace. And God's good enough to give it over and over and over again. Of course, it's not just us today, is it? People throughout history have done that. Remember Jesus, when when he was out in the woods preaching and and performing miracles, people followed him. Why? Because they wanted the great teaching? Because they wanted to see a miracle. It's kind of like a magic show for them. Let's go see what he's going to do today. They missed what he said because they were so interested in the show that he was putting on. And they missed him. Moses saw a miracle. A burning bush in the middle of of nowhere. Then he saw God. And God called out to him from the middle of that burning bush. And it changed his life forever. Took some convincing, didn't it? Moses didn't want to go, right? Moses tried five times. We only read two of them in our reading this morning. But five times Moses tried to convince God to pick somebody else. He doesn't want to go. He's not a good speaker. What if they ask what your name is? What if they ask this? What if they do this? What if they... See, Moses didn't want to change his life any more than we want to change our lives. But God loved Moses. And he loved him too much to leave him in Midian doing what he was doing. He had a great opportunity for Moses. He had a great plan, and Moses was an important part of that plan. Well, he loves you too. And he loves you too much to keep you here doing what you're doing. He's calling out to you. He's asking you to follow him. He wants to bring positive change into your life. And one of the ways that starts is with the fruits of the Spirit. We're familiar with that, right? God transforms us, bringing us those fruits that Paul talks about in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Uh, the last one. Starts with an F. Where'd it go? Self-control. That one we struggle with. <laughs> Probably a Freudian slip there. Who doesn't want those things? Who doesn't long for more love, joy, and peace in their lives? When we become open to God... And we listen to everything he says. And and we obey everything he says. Uh, We give him access to the innermost parts of our lives. He begins to transform us into someone who shows love, joy. Who experiences peace. who, Who lives out those fruits of the spirit. That's one thing he does for everybody. And that's not all he does for everybody. Because he's also... Got an opportunity for us. He has a plan that involves us. May not be as grand as saving a people. May not be as grand as Moses, what Moses did. But he's got a plan for us. Maybe he wants to use you to save somebody. Maybe not a whole people group. But maybe he's got a neighbor in mind when he calls you. Maybe he's got a relative who isn't following the Lord. And he's got you in mind for sharing his message with there. He's got something in store for you. But to get there, we have to follow him. And we have to actually do everything he asks us to do. Moses' life was never the same after he saw that burning bush. God used him in great ways. Um, Even though, in retrospect, Moses did kind of complain. (laughs) This wasn't the only complaining that Moses did. Um, But God was forgiving. And God used Moses to save a people, the Hebrew people, God's people. As I said, he may not have something that, that big in store for us, but he's got something in store for us. You just need to remain open to him and and follow him and do everything he asks you to do. Folks, that bush is still burning today, figuratively at least. The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The God that that called out to Moses in that burning bush is calling out to you. Have you heard him? 
If you stop to explore what it is to follow him, and have you committed your life to him? If not, see me this morning. See if I can't help you along that journey. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for calling out to us where we are, for what you have for us. Help us, Father, as we hear your call to give up our own ambitions and just do what you ask us to do, everything you ask us to do, knowing that it could be our lives will never be the same. Take us out of that comfort level, out of that contentment, and help us just to, uh, to share, to serve, to follow. In Jesus' name.